because they did not understand. I want it to be known and understood what it means to have this Christian walk as believers in Christ. And it'll probably save me a few years because Holland has clogged up my arteries and caused me to be stressful and have all these surgeries. I think I need to calm myself down and talk to y'all so I can hang around a little bit longer. And so, so pray with me, pray for me on that uh, because I just mainly want to do God's will. And that is make sure that the message goes forth as God would have it to. Uh, not my will, but his will be done. There were some people in the church in the days of Paul that were too ignorant when it came to their relationship with God. Uh, there were many uh, who had opposed this belief that, that there was no way that spirit uh, that uh, good and evil could dwell in the same temple. Uh, they, they were called Gnostics in that they did not believe that good and evil could dwell in the same temple. In other words, they did not believe that the spirit dwelt in people that did bad things. But I want to share with you today and to my brother, who has given his life to Christ. I celebrate with you today. But I, I celebrate, when we celebrate with you as family, we're thankful and grateful to God that you've given your life to God. But, but that's just the beginning of sorrow. You think you had trouble before you got saved. I come to share with you that even more trouble is coming now because Satan is angry that you've decided to give your life to to God and now he's going to do everything that he can do to turn you around but 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 I got some good news for you uh, no matter what you do Christ secured you in that when he died for you his blood sealed you until the day of redemption now now him saving you does not mean that you won't yet continue to fall short Sometimes you're going to miss the mark. But, and it's not an excuse for you to sin. But the Bible said that all of us, as long as we're living in this earthen vessel, have sinned and come short of his glory. But, but thanks be to God that gives us victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. In that we can go to God in prayer. How many today know that prayer still works? Listen, you can call him anytime and he's able not only to hear prayer, but he's able to answer every prayer. If your heart is right and you mean it from your heart, God can wipe the slate clean. And that's why every morning I have to acknowledge that I'm yet still a work in progress. And I'm not ashamed to own the fact that I've made some mistakes along the way. And, and, I, and I've gone to understand, too, that now I've got to stop calling them mistakes and call them a spade a spade. And so now when I pray, I don't just say, Lord, you know uh, I've sinned and come short of your glory. But now when I go to God, I say, Lord, I got some issues with this. And I got some issues with that. Notice I didn't tell you what it is because it ain't your business. And can I share with you today, whatever you're going through, it ain't nobody's business but yours and God. Listen, I can't, I can't solve your problem. There's only one somebody that can solve your problem. His name is Jesus. And if you go to God in secret prayer and lead, and the Bible says, cast all your cares upon him, he is the one that really cares for you. So now when I pray, I don't just say, Lord, well, you know I've sinned and come short of your glory. I say, no, Lord, I got some problem with this. And I got some problems with that. And I'm still coming up short. I need your help to get me beyond these problems that I'm dealing with that I know you're not pleased with. Who am I talking to here today that know that, listen, we got to stop talking over sin and start calling sin what it really is. Sin is just sin. But we've got a God that's able. <laughs>
to forgive us of our sin. That's why 1 John 1 and 9 says that we need to confess our sin. That means we need to tell what it is. And there's nothing wrong. You ought not be ashamed to tell Jesus what it is in secret prayer because Jesus already bore the cross, already suffered the shame. So what you so shame about now? You wasn't shame when you were doing it. So don't be ashamed to tell God what it is. There were some people that could not believe the concept that, that if, if, spirit, if spiritualness dwelt in an individual, there was no way that they could, there's no way that, 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 that good and evil could dwell in the same temple. And so this teaching of Jesus Christ going on a hill called Calvary one Friday evening who, who knew no sin, this concept of him who knew no sin taking on the sins of the world, and dying on the cross was not believable. And so there was, there, was a, there was a confrontation with believers and unbelievers in that this whole concept of Christ taking on sin, there was no way that a good person could take on sin and conquer it on the cross. But can I share with you today, over 2019 years ago, this whole scripture from John 3.16 became a reality. In that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That if you believe that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Roman Paul talked to the Roman church in Romans chapter 10 and said that you can confess with your mouth. And believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus, that, that he died and God raised him from the dead. He said, thou shalt be saved. But they could not grasp this concept of a holy God taking on sin for some folk who didn't deserve. And so Paul writes this letter uh, to the church there at Colossae. First of all, help us to recognize who we are in Christ. So he wants to give to these Gnostics and to those believers who are struggling with this concept because this concept kind of got to some believers in that, in that they got confused. And so to break up the confusion, Paul says, listen, if you're saved, uh, there's, a, there's a new way of living. And that you need to understand if, if you be in Christ, then Christ is also in you. And so therefore, if you be in Christ, knowing and believing that he died, and rose again and then went back to the father you need to understand that your mindset now if christ is in you and you be in christ and christ is in you you need to understand that your mindset ought to be on the one who died for you and went back to the father sitting at the right hand if he's sitting at the right hand your thoughts ought to be above and not beneath there's a new way of living and he gives us the fundamentals of Christian living in that, first of all, you need to get your mind focused on the things that are above you and not the things that are beneath. And not only that, but we need to have our minds focused on the things that are above us and not the things that are around us. Because there's things that are around us that can cause us to sin. Evil is present in this world. And, and what's so, what's so uh, 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 remarkable, about this, remarkable about this living is that even though he saved us, Satan, again, knows our heart, N knows our, our trigger point. He knows what we like worldly and what we don't like. And the things that we like worldly, Satan knows that. And everybody's love or everybody's liking of the things of this world is different. And nobody in here can tell me that they don't like some of the things of the world. Even though you've been saved, there's, we yet still like some things of this world. I don't know anybody here that don't like money. I don't know, any, but, but money is a thing of this world. I don't know anybody who don't love to drive nice cars. But, but nice cars are a thing of this world. I don't know anybody that don't like to dress nice. 
but, but our clothing are things of this world. So you can't sit up here and tell me that you don't love some things of this world. You yet do because you, you really focus on them more so than, than him. And that's why Paul is writing. He says, y'all focus is on the wrong thing. You, you need to not focus on those things that are around you, but your focus needs to be on the one who is above you. In other words, you need to have the same mindset that Jimmy Ruth had this morning when she said the Lord is blessing us. <laughs> he woke us up this morning. Started us on our way. You need to be thinking about the God that didn't let you sleep too late. But woke you right on time. Now don't, don't worry about these things going on around you. Even though listen, you may have got up this morning and your lights was off. But can you thank God that you get still had eyes and you could see? And listen, most of us, if we really been in our house long enough, we don't need no light. You can feel your way through. But he got you up this morning. And so you don't not worry about the fact that maybe your lights wasn't on this morning, but thank God that you got up and you got eyes that can see. I may not be able to see with light, but I can see because I know where I am. So get your thoughts on things that are above and, and not the things that... In, in verse 2 he says, and I, I can tell you, verse 2 he says, he says, set your affection. That, note, that word also could refer to it as, as passion. Set your, set your passion or your affection on the things above and not the things that are on this earth. He says, for now, in this Christian walk, you are dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. He says, this Christ was not only the Son, but he was also God himself. And so he says, now your life, and that word hid can also be referred to as protected. Your life is now protected in Christ because you've died to the old man. And now you're living or you're beginning to live this process of this new man that's in Christ. It's no more about what I want, no more, no more about what I need, but it's about what Christ says. And our lives are now protected in Christ until he come back again. So, so can I share with you today, uh, I found this out too about my, my father. Uh, and, and I've told this story before. I've done, I did a lot of bad stuff coming up. I, I, I wouldn't, you know. I call myself being slick, but I wasn't slick enough. And, and. My, my mother and father knew that. And, and, and I've done some really bad stuff, cost them some pretty good money that, you know, we probably could have had more groceries that week. And maybe they could have paid the bills on time, but, but I cost them a lot because I, I was hard-headed and, and mischievous and did a lot of stuff. But, but can I tell you, uh, out, of the, out of the 22 years that I had experience with my father and of the, of the uh, uh, over... Forty-something years I've had uh, with, with my mother yet still alive. Uh, can I share with you today that there was nothing that I did, even though it may have upset them, even though it may have angered them, and even though they may have had some choice words for me, Brother Douglas, and they did have some choice words at times. There was nothing that I did that, that they did not forgive me for. You want to talk about some good parents. I had some good parents, and I did some things that disappointed them, but there was nothing that I did that my mother and father did not forgive me. And, and, and listen, I never lost my sonship in the family because of my disobedience. Even though I had messed up, I was still Charlie Frank and Ola Jean's boy. Can I share with you today, us being saved, we have the same type of father that lives in glory. In that all of us can be honest today and say we've done some things that we know God was not pleased with. In fact, we might have did something this morning. We know God wasn't pleased with, but, but we can celebrate the fact that we serve a God. That even though we've done things that he's not pleased with. He does not hold it against us until the day we die, but yet he forgives us, and he, we don't lose our relationship with him just because we've done some things that disappointed him. 
In other words, even though we've sinned and come short of his glory, he still looks at us as his children. Now, y'all missing a place to go and celebrate that. Listen, I can stop right there because somebody here today can be honest. You've done some things that you should have been dead. You've done some things you could have been dead. You've done some things you would have been dead. But I wonder if there anybody here this morning that can thank God for the love of Jesus Christ who yet still loves us in spite of us and still sees us as his children. Come on, thank God today that even though we disobedient children, he loves us because we belong to him. Listen, mess over your neighbor. Mess over the person sitting next to you. And I guarantee you they won't sit next to you next, next Sunday. M mess over the person sitting next to you. And I guarantee you they won't sit with you next Sunday. But, but, but the love of Christ says you can't do enough. To keep me from sitting beside you. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to talk with you. I'm going to stay with you. I'm going to take care of you. Even though you're a hard-headed rascal, you still belong to me. I ain't going to disown you just because you're head hard. He says, if you understand that, he says, this relationship that you have with Christ, it, it consists of you understanding that if you be in Christ and Christ being, you've got to kill these things that cause you to separate from him. And he gives some specifics. And when he talks about, again, when he talks about uh, uh, us being hid with him, and, and if you read the next verse, he says, when Christ, who is our life. So when we die to self, then now our life is about who? Christ. Y'all can start talking back to me because that's what we're going to have in the next few weeks. So y'all can open up your mouth and talk back to me. Listen, so since we are dead to self, now we are alive to who? Talk to me in this place. And if we be alive to Christ, we are secured until the day he comes back. And when he comes back, he's going to be the one that ushers us in the glory. In other words, it's important to understand the importance of having this relationship a lot of folks talking about going to heaven, but don't talk about the relationship they have with Christ. But can I share with you today, you need to be telling people about the relationship you have with Christ. Because no relationship with Christ, no home in glory. But if you got a relationship with Christ, can I share with you what Christ is doing right now? He's building your room next to the house. And when, when your room get ready, and he put his name, put your name on your room. I don't know when it may be, but when, when your name is put on your door, he's going to call your name and you got the answer. But isn't it good to know that you got somebody that's working on your building? And when the building is set, one day he's going to call all of us home. And what I like about this Christ is that out of all of creation, out of all of humanity, this God is so wise. That when our names are put on the door of our room, we ain't got to find out where to go. All we have to do is look for our name. And aren't you glad that he knows all of us by our name? And so we need to understand that, that, that our life is protected until the day he comes. And when he comes, he's coming back. That we may go back with him where he is in glory. He says, so learn and understand that our life now is no longer about us, but our life is about Christ. Mm. He says, therefore, if you're dead, you understand this concept of being dead. Whatever you're dealing with in the flesh, he says, you got to learn how to mortify or kill. Yeah, he said, if, if you're going to be dead to the world, Kill those things of the world. And he goes on to give you those things in, in particular. Uh, but there, there, there are many more, but he gives some things in specific. And those, most of those things that he gives are things that, first of all, catch your eye. Then once it catch your eye, it penetrates your heart. And then when it penetrates your heart, it, it, it also produces an action. 
He says, be careful with those things that'll mess you up in your eye. Because once your eye receives it, your heart will accept it, and then your hands will start doing it. He says, so be careful with that. He said, the best thing you need to do, don't, don't focus on it. Only if your focus is on it, let your focus be on it only to do one thing. And that's to kill it. Kill those things. And don't wait till father time. What God really wants is God really wants us to do it while we're yet still in our youth and in our virility. The true, the true test of a strong Christian and a strong believer is that when they're in their prime. And I use it like that. When you're, when you're still good and you're in your prime, there are no aches and pains about the body. You, know, you can jump up. You ain't got to slide out the bed. You ain't got to put one foot on the floor first before you put the other one. But when you can just jump up out the bed, he says, I want you to start killing it then. Don't wait till you get old and you can't do nothing else. He said, but why are you yet still young? Start killing this stuff. A lot of us wait till, till father time has taken its, its course. In other words, you done got too old to do anything but that. He, he says, don't, don't wait till you get too old. But why are you yet in your youth? If you really want to honor God and glory God while you're yet on this earth, he says, start killing some things in your youth. A lot of people don't, don't start coming to church till, till, till they done got too old to go to the club. Tell the truth in here today. You know, you get to the point when you step in the club, everybody young but you. And you feel out of place. And before you know it, you ease on out. Because you know you're too old. He said, don't wait. Don't wait till you get to that point. He said, but while you're yet still in your youth, while you can yet still be a blessing in your youth, he says, start killing those things that cause you to sin against the will of God. He said, he said kill it. Because all of those things are idolatry. They're against the will of God. He said, and, and when, you were, when you were ignorant to the fact you did it unknowing. Now you know the difference between that which is good and evil. He says, now, now I hold you accountable. You're responsible now. Now that you're saved, you, you're being held accountable for the thing that you do. When, when you weren't saved and didn't know any better, yet you were doing those things. And, and every child uh, uh, did those things that were against the will of God because they were children of disobedience. He said, but now we're striving for this perfection. Now we're working as children of obedience in that our responsibility now is to kill those things that cause us to be disobedient, but, but, but began to do those things that will cause us to be obedient that God might be glorified. And death, death, death is not hard. Death is easy. Kill it. Somebody, well, Reverend, that's hard. That, that, that's hard. You talking about kill it. That, 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 ain't, that ain't easy to do. Did, did you see what happened in baptism today? And baptism today was only a symbolism what, of what had already taken place. A few weeks ago, uh, what Thomas did was he gave his life to Christ, which, which means he died that day. Yeah, yeah, he, he died that day. What we did today was to show the symbolism of what that death really is. And that his whole body from his head to his toe has now been cleansed and given unto God. And so what we did today, we just went ahead and put it in the ground. And when he came up, he was no longer the person that he was before he went in the ground. But, but can I share with you today, that didn't happen today. That was just a visual what happened a couple of weeks ago when he gave his life to Christ he buried Thomas then and then he started living unto Christ 
So this life he's been living the past couple of weeks has been a life that's been given to Christ. He's no longer himself, but he now belongs to Christ. And because he belongs to Christ, he has to put off those things that are not like Christ. Not just him, but every one of us who confess that Jesus Christ is Lord need to take off those things that, that are not like Christ. Listen, th this is just a dress rehearsal for when we get in glory. Th that's what it is. This is a dress rehearsal for when we get in the glory. And if we don't have on the right apparel, we can't get in. You, you know how y'all look at some folk that don't come in here looking quite right? They ain't got no suit on or ain't got no, no Sunday, what y'all call a Sunday dress on. You, you, you know, we look at folks and we say they ain't dressed for church. And we focus on, on their outside. Because they didn't have you know, any Sunday shoes on, but they had tennis shoes on. We, 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 we began to categorize them as not being, not being dressed for church. But, but can I share with you today, Jesus is not concerned about how you look on the outside. Je Jesus is concerned about how you, you, you are on the inside. He wants to know how are you dressed on the inside because can I share with you today that there are some folk that dress real good on the outside. And you up in here today, you looking real good dressed up on the outside, but, but your insides is jacked up. You're sagging on the inside. You got holes on the inside. You didn't wash on the inside, and your inside is messed up, but your outside looking good. Jesus said, mortify those things that make you look good on the outside. He said, but start, start dressing from the inside out. Many of us on Sunday morning dress from the outside in. We come to church, but our, our hearts ain't right. And we look good on the outside, but our insides has no resemblance of Christ anywhere. We'll come in here, we'll say anything to anybody, we'll roll our eyes at anybody, we'll move to the other side just so we won't have to be on the same side as somebody else, simply because our hearts aren't right. And we look good on the outside, but our insides are totally corrupt. He said, if you want to help your outside, work on the inside. See, see, this whole outside should be influenced by how you are on the inside. And, and your, your outer appearance ought to be influenced by your inner most teaching. But, but if your outer appearance is influencing your inward thoughts, he said, then you got it back. He said, but let your inward thoughts, let it control and rule your outward appearance if your heart is right you'll know how to love your enemy if your heart is right you'll know how to treat your neighbor as yourself if your heart is right you can bless those who curse you if your heart is right you can forgive those who despitefully misuse you but if your heart ain't right if somebody lie on you you'll mess around and lie on them if your heart ain't right if somebody cuss you you turn around and cuss them but if your heart is right, they can cuss you and you can bless them anyhow. He, 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 said, he, said, he said, you're not like that anymore because what you're doing every day now, what is our responsibility? Our responsibility every day is to kill those things that are against the will of God and begin to produce those things. Because Jesus said this in John chapter 15, and I'm, I'm going to hurry away. Jesus said this in John chapter 15. He says, listen. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Everything that, that, that does not produce fruit, he, he, he taketh away. So, so John chapter 15 really says is, I'm going away, and when I come back, I need some evidence that you produce some fruit. And he says the only way that you can produce fruit is that some things on the vine got to be taken away because those things, some of those things on the vine is going to cause you to rot. You know, we talked about the fact you know, any, anybody know anything about a fruit tree? Uh, a fruit tree has to be pruned. And, and the earlier you prune it, the better off uh, your crop's going to be. But if you happen to let them grow up and they become fruitful, just like a peach tree, if two peaches get to growing together and they, they're too close together, once they get big enough, they're going to start touching one another. 
And before they get fully grown, as they touch one another, they're going to start feeding off one another. And ultimately, one's going to outdo the other, and ultimately, both of them are going to end up dying because they need room to grow. And if they don't have room to grow, they'll end up dying because they had no room to grow. There are some things in our lives that we don't need. And if we happen to keep them in our lives, they're going to stun our growth. And we're going to find ourselves not growing because we're not willing to let some stuff go. And so he says, if you're going to grow, you've got to let some stuff go. Yeah. You've got to kill some stuff that what God produces through you may continue to grow because when he come back he's going to be looking for evidence of those things that he has charged us to what did he charge us to well let me just tell you he charged us to a few things he says listen we need to understand to have the importance of not uh, uh putting off these things he says anger and, and 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 i've seen some mad folks in church wrath I've seen some folk that take that anger and act it out. I, I've seen some, I've actually seen some fighting in church. Yeah, yeah. I hope I never see it here, but in my day, I've seen fighting in church. Malice, you know, ill will against, against folk, blasphemy, saying those things that aren't true, filthy communication, oh Lord, out of your mouth, lying to one another, all of these things. He says, you need to understand the putting off all of these things. Yeah, that you may be able to put on these new things that are in Christ. He says, and it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what your background is. All of us have access to Christ if we give our life to him. You know, there were some, there were some uh, Jews that thought that the only somebody that God really loved was the Jews. But Jesus said, no, I came for everybody. Jew, Greek, Gentile. He said, I came for the Scythian, the barbarian, whosoever will. That's what I like about Christ. You know, he didn't limit himself just to one somebody or one particular ethnicity. He, but he was a God for all, and he invited himself to everybody. So it doesn't matter whether you're black or white, rich or poor. It doesn't matter whether you're single or married. It doesn't matter what kind of background you come from. Jesus died for all, that all might receive him, that all might be children of God through him. He says, therefore, if you're going if you're going to put on something, he says, put on this, verse 12. He says, as the elect of God. So you need to understand, you're just not saved by accident. This being the elect of God means that before you were even in this work, God chose you. Now, now, when that time would come that you might receive him, only God knew that. But, but God knew before you even came into this world who was his and who wasn't. So therefore, if you're a child of God, you're considered God's elect. He chose you way before you chose him. Because he, he chose us. He says, he chose us holy and beloved. He says, put these things on. Mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, always thinking yourself lower than others, putting others before yourself. That's hard for a lot of us to do, but, but he says, if you want to be the elect of God, you've got to learn to put yourself. If Jesus, who, who the Bible says in Philippians uh, chapter 2, if, if the Bible says that if Jesus, who was not only the image of God, but was God himself, as he took on the form of a servant, even though he was equal with God, the Bible says if, that Jesus made himself of no, rep no reputation, but made himself even a little lower than the angels. If Jesus humbled himself, then we need to understand the importance of humbling ourselves. And it starts in the mind be merciful be kind be humble be meek be low and and, and be able to have patience that long suffering is really being able to have some patience to hold on even as trouble may be in your life forbearing one another forgiving one another if any man have a quarter text says against any as christ forgave you you need to forgive them. 
And there ought not be any circumstances on your forgiveness. I'll forgive you if. No, that's not forgiving. No, no, no. You, you, you forgive just because the God you serve forgives you. And if the God you serve forgives you, you need to be willing to forgive others. And listen, you ought not wait. When it, comes, when it comes time to forgive, you ought not put any time frame on when you forgive them. Listen, you ought to be ready to forgive at all times because Jesus is waiting, ready to forgive every time we confess our sin before him. And if Jesus is waiting and ready to forgive, he says we got to be the same way, waiting and ready to forgive at all times. It ought not be in the circumstances on our forgiveness. For as Christ forgave you, he says, so also do ye. And above all that, I told you this last week, that really it can only be accomplished through charity or through love. If you put on the love of Christ, you can accomplish all of these things because it's the love of Christ that gives us the will to do. You can't do it by yourself. So when you say I can't do it by myself, you're not lying because you really can't do it by yourself. You need the help of God. If God didn't help you, there'd be no way you'd be able to forgive. But, but because Christ lives on the inside. The same spirit that he forgives you with is the same spirit that you forgive others, not because you all that, but because Christ is all that. And if he forgives me, I ought to be willing to forgive him. Mm. He said, let the peace of God rule in your hearts, which also you're called into one body. In all of this, he says, learn to be thankful. Don't let anybody sway you in your thinking. Yes, Jesus died. Yes, Jesus rose. Yes, Jesus took on sin. The reason why it was so unbelievable for the Gnostic and the reason why it's so unbelievable for those who do not believe in him because it doesn't make sense. To a carnal mind. But to a spiritual mind, it makes much sense because we know that nobody can do what we need done in our life, our life. Nobody can do for us like Jesus does for us. Nobody can give us the peace which surpasses all understanding. Nobody can give us joy. When everything around us seemed to be sinking sand. Nobody can rock us when we are weary. Like Jesus can. Nobody can hold us. Like Jesus holds us. Nobody can love us. Like Jesus loves us. And I need somebody here this morning. To give glory to God for the love of Jesus. And that grandmama said it like this. Can't nobody. Do me like Jesus. Can't nobody do me like the Lord. Nobody can rock me like Jesus can. Nobody can love me like Jesus can. Nobody can pick me up, turn me around, place my feet on solid ground. No, not nobody. Nobody but Jesus, nobody can make me love my enemy like Jesus can. Nobody can make me treat my neighbor right like Jesus can. Therefore, I got a made up mind that is no more about me, but it's all about him. And I thank God for the love of Jesus. So one Friday evening, the Bible says on a hill called Calvary, what seemed impossible became possible. What seemed unreal became reality. 
in the Jesus Christ our Lord. God's one and only begotten son. The one who knew no sin in an unbelievable moment took on the sins of the world. They had been looking high and low for somebody that was able to redeem man and they couldn't find nobody that could redeem man. They thought about Moses as he led the children through Egypt and down through the prompt through the wilderness into the promised land. But they found out that Moses was too, too mean and too angry. And somewhere along the way, he may have gotten mad and given up the journey so they couldn't use Brother Moses. And I'm glad they didn't use Moses so they thought about if Moses can't do it, maybe I'll get Brother Abraham to stand in the stead of humanity. But I found out Abraham had some problems too. You know, Abraham, when he was on his way through Egypt, he lied saying that Sarah was his sister and not his wife. I don't think I can use Abraham because Abraham, when the road get rough, and when they start asking questions, Abraham, instead of telling the truth, he just might tell a lie. And I don't need nobody lying, hanging on my cross. So as they looked around, they still couldn't find nobody. They thought about Brother David, because you know David was a man after God's own heart. But David had problems too. In that one day while he was standing out on the rooftop, he saw a lady taking a bath. And he knew that lady belonged to somebody else. But because she looked so good, she had to have, he had to have her for himself. I don't think I can use David because the pr first pretty woman had come across. Yeah, he may just come down from the cross and start chasing them pretty women. So I can't use Brother David. They began to look a little further. Uh, I can't use David. What about his son? He said, well, we can try Solomon. But Solomon, just like his father, he like a chip off the old block. Instead of him having a few wives, he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And, and soon as another woman come across, he just might want to marry her. So he's not worthy to stand in man's stead. After searching all through the Bible, they realized they couldn't find anybody that was sinless and could stand instead for humanity. But there was one, and I'm glad today that there was only, only one. Can I get somebody to raise one finger today and thank God for the one? There was one somebody that was able to stand in man's stead, sitting in the right hand of the, of the Father, after searching all over heaven and earth, sitting in the right hand of the Father, was a man by the name of Jesus, who knew no sin, who had never sinned, whom God had trusted, because the same was in the Father, and the Father was in him. It was only one that was able to bear my burdens in the heat of the day. That same one. Can I get you to raise it one more time? Went up to Calvary's hill. One man. One cross. At the cross. That one man shed his blood for you and me. At the cross. One man looked up toward heaven and said father into your hand i commend my spirit one man one cross that same man died one friday that same one man was taken down and laid in one tomb can somebody say one cross one man one tomb he stayed there all night Friday night that one man stayed there all day Saturday that one man stayed there all night Saturday night but I'm so glad that it only took one man because early Sunday morning one man one cross 
one grave, one resurrection. Because early Sunday morning, that one man got up, said, all power is in my hand. Can I get somebody to look at your neighbor and raise up one finger and thank God for one man? Thank God for one man. Thank God for Jesus today. Ain't he all right? Shout he yeah. Ain't he all right? Shout he yeah. Ain't he all right? Shout he yeah. I'm not the same because of one man. One man changed my life. One man rules my life. One man is keeping my life. His name is Jesus. He can do it for you if you're here today and you're unsaved. If you have not given your life to Christ, one man 